Welcome everyone to the Cyberphysics Podcast, where we unravel the complex web of cybersecurity through the lens of its foundational principles. I'm your host, and today, we embark on an intellectual journey that mirrors the intricacy of physics itself. Joining us are two remarkable experts, Rungan Venkatraman and Adrian Smith, as we delve into cyberphysics in essence. Uh, my name's Adrian Smith. I've um, been uh, in the IT profession, if you like, for quite a long time. You can probably tell by the grey hair. Um, I started um, I started life actually as an apprentice at an engineering company, and a form of IT apprenticeship. And uh, those were the days when we still had tapes, reel-to-reel tapes. The data memory was extortionate. Hard disks were quite small. And computers were really just doing mundane mathematical calculations and producing tabulated reports, etc. But actually, I got very interested in um, things like video text, which was a technology using televisions and cheap monitors to display color graphics. It was quite widely deployed in the 70s and 80s. Um, And in the 80s, the London Stock Exchange uh, decided to use the system called Topic. And I was one of the designers uh, and analysts on that project. And that threw me into quite uh, an interesting marketplace, which is stockbroking. I moved from stockbroking to property development company as head of IT. And then after that uh, five-year tenure, I started to work with uh, a a disparate range of companies in, in different markets, uh, acting as uh, IT manager, either on a full-time basis or on a fractional basis. And this continued through the 90s and the early uh, 21st century, obviously with the development of the internet and so on, to the point where I started working uh, for a company in the city of London called Antisatis, and also my own company, which uh, I founded with some colleagues back in 1988 uh, as a consultancy and, and that's what I've been doing ever since. And that is I've been working with both uh, global organizations and smaller organizations, in particularly in the UK and EU, on solutions and finding pragmatic solutions to problems. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I, run, uh, I run uh, essentially three companies, um, you know, Resilience that focuses on AI, Pinnacle that focuses on cybersecurity and um, Curious that focuses on an edtech uh, platform. So, uh, in terms of uh, your area of interest, I mean, uh, do you like technology broadly? Are you more interested in cybersecurity? And we can basically talk through uh, that based on your interest and your capability in that space. Um, I like technology when it's when it provides um, an improvement to an existing service or capability. I like technology where it can introduce a new feature to society or a new service to society. I'm not a big fan of technology that is introduced um, where it doesn't really provide any improvements, any noticeable improvements. It seems to me to be quite a waste of effort. But for the most part, I've engaged with uh, new technologies quite early on. Um, I've become slightly cynical over the years of some of the new technologies and I've seen things come and go. I'm being particularly interested in not just what you would call now cybersecurity, but general system security for probably about 30 years, Um, you know, which of course uh, is important to make sure that any of your data or processes are protected. So things like cybersecurity, which is obviously a very big and has been a very hot topic for the last decade, and more recently AI and perhaps AI's involvement with future cyber security solutions is something I'm particularly interested in. That's wonderful. So maybe you can uh, maybe start with um, technologies that uh, you believe are not adding value, and then maybe an example of a technology that you believe is adding value. Okay, well, I'll I'll start. I think I'll start. I'll do it the other way around, if that's okay. I'll, let's talk talk about something I think really is adding value and a technology which, by itself, added value from the get go was GPS. I mean, GPS to me was a was a, was a, something very interesting. I, I had a history as a radio amateur, radio ham, 
And so the idea of talking to people over radios and communicating, etc., using uh, that kind of technology was, was something I was very interested in. And then GPS technology, of course, using satellite systems to provide you with uh, your location was a piece of technology which I thought was, was really, really useful. Of course, it came out of a need for the defence organisations around the world to decide how to locate their forces and how to deliver ordnance, etc., and destroy the right things and not hit the wrong things. But in its um, day-to-day use, I think GPS has been one of those technologies that uh, has been been very good and, and and actually pervasive, and so therefore everybody's using it whether they know it or not. And but then there's a negative side to that. And that is that because I have to have my phone on with the GPS capability in it, I'm constantly being tracked. So there is a negative element here that people have become very accustomed to the idea of being tracked and traced by their phone. On one hand, they take it for granted. That's the price they pay for having a free GPS system. But they're the same people that often scream when they think their government is tracking and tracing them for other purposes. And so uh, I think the education here is really to teach people that actually nothing is free, whether it's GPS, whether it's your social media accounts, they're always providing something to an organization that has value. I think somebody once said to me that if, if the service is free, you know, basically, um, you know, you're, you're, you're providing them with something tangible financially, they wouldn't be doing it otherwise. So there's an example there of a couple of things that are both good and have some bad side effects. Yeah, and I think, you know, whether you refer to social media, whether you refer to GPS and all of these technologies at the end of the day, it's like um, a process where you're the product. At the end of the day, as a user, yeah. we become the product. And it is about both the user as well as the optimization for the ecosystem because the value you create is not a, a bi-directional value. It is network effects. And the network effects happen only when you have a lot of people in it. Case in point, you know, Google acquired a GPS platform, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was called Maze. And it used um, that kind of information where when you're traveling, you can actually, you know, user provided input saying there's traffic, there's an accident, whatnot. And it sort of collates that information to know exactly what's going on in that space. And it's sort of a, a social GPS for the lack of a better word. Mm. And uh, so that's the value that the user provides to the ecosystem. And as a result, every additional user creates more value to the entire ecosystem that is using it. And that power of network effects is very, very powerful. With that said, right, I mean, all of these things serve sort of three purposes. One is they can be a tool set, you know, a tool set, you know, a GPS can be counted as a tool set. You can also, you know, leverage it as a magnet where it is used to sort of attract, uh, you know, usage. And last but not the least, it can also be used like a broker that sort of exchanges information between, you know, say two different entities or multiple different entities. So. The, uh, the power in this technology lies in its network effects with the side effects of cyber security and specifically data privacy. Mm. Well, I mean, and, and, and we're just talking about GPS and, and social media generally. We've become so reliant upon them and we trust them inherently. Uh, you know, that we don't expect our phone to tell us we're in the wrong location. We don't expect something on social media and to be, if you, you see your friend on social media, you make a comment, you, you don't think it's not your friend, you trust it to be your friend. And this feeds into that discussion about trust. Who do you trust, who do you not trust? And social media, of course, has opened up so many channels by which somebody can contact me, for example. So as a, in, the, in my role with a couple of firms where I'm responsible for the security or head of security or head of IT, I should say, I am constantly being attacked. I'm being attacked by organizations that want to sell me something uh, because you know that's their job to try and sell something. I'm constantly being attacked by people who, and when I say attacked, what I mean is somebody is, rather than writing a simple letter to me or an email and saying, 
Adrian, do you think we could do business? Do you think we could sell you something? I get attacked in the sense that people make assumptions or make claims through those channels that they know me, they have some empathy, some relationship. They can refer to something they've read about me online. They can use those kinds of techniques to convince me that I know them or should trust them. Whereas historically, you would never have created that trust so quickly. And I think that's that's something that um, is, is a negative side of it. For example, I can look up somebody's details online and I might be able to very quickly establish, you know, their hobbies, their family and those kinds of things, which I can very easily craft in such a way as to become an old school friend or a mate that used to work at the same company. And then again, the trust is being built, but actually there should be no trust. And this is the to me, the fundamental weakness of every organization is that unless they understand who they can and can't trust and why they should and shouldn't trust, their entire um, security uh, policies will be fundamentally flawed. They cannot rely just on third party technology to protect them. It's got to start with those people in the organization thinking about simple, simple everyday trust. So. The, the framework that really helps here uh, from a security perspective is trust nothing, verify everything. Yes. And, uh, you know, I think inherently we have to unfortunately live in a world where you have to sort of go to that model, which is essentially called zero trust in security. And, uh, you know, that sort of gives you you know, for the lack of a better word, the ultimate level of protection. And if you combine zero trust with defense in depth, and if you combine it with the right compliance framework, you have a process, a flywheel, in other words, that sort of gets you to a place where you can do exactly what you're referring to. And uh, that, I think, is the, the heart and soul of a process that needs to be implemented. And defense in depth means focusing on all the layers of security. Compliance is a form of a uh, place where you use different frameworks, ISO, SOC2, etc. And of course, you have the uh, process of zero trust, which is also a methodology that keeps that framework where you basically say trust nothing and verify everything. Yeah. And the problem, of course, with the trust, uh, trust nothing and, and, and verify is if your supply chain is fundamental to your business and your supply chain is compromised. And I think We'll both be aware of some supply chain problems over the last two or three years where it was very difficult for the end user of those services to fully understand whether there was a problem with it, how to check its capabilities. And of course, uh, lots of companies were let down by their supply chain. Uh, and so after your staff, which are probably one of your biggest risks, your supply chain, the people you've been buying software from or services from for, for years, possibly decades, and suddenly through the back door sneaks in a new piece of software they've introduced or an upgrade, which has some flaw, which allows somebody else to get into your system or monitor what you're doing. Um, so the supply chain, which we sort of got to be trusting automatically is now no longer uh, trustworthy. I would agree with that. I mean, that is actually uh, what is often referred to as the man, man in the middle. Yeah. And uh, you have a scenario where somebody else can come and impersonate you uh, as if they happen to be the real thing. I mean, we've seen this uh, in many uh, uses of technology. For example, you could have somebody who can mimic a voice. Today with Halo, you can um, essentially look like someone who's a native speaker of a particular language. Mm -hmm. um, you know, depending on the number of languages you speak, you could probably speak a language, say, from India or from Morocco or from China, as an example, and uh, look like a native speaker. Mm -hmm. so, so you can use technologies very clearly to do certain things that were not possible previously. Deep fakes is a big, uh, is a big issue because you can create photos today 
that have been fixed. So, for example, Meta is planning to tag AI-based images going forward, you know, so that people know it was an image that was created by an AI tool, not necessarily by a human. Mm. It's a good step forward because you have that degree of additional protection. Otherwise, you really don't have a way of knowing whether some picture is a deep fake or not. Yeah, I'm 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 familiar with deep fakes, but but I, as far as I'm aware, we've never witnessed any particular intrusion attempts using them. Um, we we were I mean I think most people became quite adept at spotting spam emails by the poor grammar and spelling um, within them. It, classically, they you know they'd have words spelt incorrectly or phrases that were wrong, and it gave it away as being well either a non-native speaker or a poor somebody perhaps is poorly educated, or where they're they're trying to hack you or to get something to you where it, perhaps English wasn't their first language and so on. With the um, the advent of, of AI, of course, you can make a fairly poorly constructed sentence or paragraph now look very, very good, almost too good. So uh, we started to teach people that on the one hand, there are things that look really bad and they are probably fake and they, they're something suspicious. But on the other hand, if it's too good, you can treat it with some suspicion as well. And it's always nice to, to drop in I always, I always find in my emails, if I'm, if I'm writing something, I always drop in a spelling mistake or a, co a comment, which if it's somebody I know, they'll know it's me. If it's somebody pretending to be somebody I know, they won't know and they won't respond. So it, 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 it depends. I mean, in social media, you'll, you'll have a particular way of writing things to your f friends and family. Uh, I have a particular style. It's completely different to my children and my wife, but they know it's me. The day I try to generate my messages in the style that they do, they'll know it's fake dad. And I think we have the same thing with commercial email and, and more commercial relationships electronically that um, you will we will start to put in tests to see whether something is poor on the one hand and, and dismiss it or too good. And um, we, you know, we'll treat that with some suspicion as well. And I think that also would include um, voice systems. Well, I think voice systems now are on their way out. I know that uh, a couple of banks in the UK, for example, use voice recognition systems as a way of going through security. Um, in fact, the two banks that I banked with, both of them did this. And within three years of implementing that system, withdrew the system because it was too easy to create an authentic fake voice just by capturing a few sentences of what I was saying. So um, you can see something that was held up at the time as being a game changer on security, voice prints, is now withdrawn. I don't think any bank in the UK now uses voice prints as security. We had the same concept, I think, with thumbprints on phones, and that's been discredited, and now we've got facial recognition, etc., which, as far as I know, set up correctly, is actually quite good and regarded as being quite good. I think it's at the end of the day, um, you know, a combination of technologies that may actually be the answer as opposed to one thing. I think, you know, when you combine, combine facial recognition, fingerprinting, uh, and maybe voice, even, you know, looking at the retina of your eye, those technologies sort of when they come together with some password-based authentication, and some MFA to go with it, you have to, that's what we call defense in depth, mm. where we can layer the technologies so that, you know, because we all know no technology is foolproof. So you have to just um, ensure that by breaking a combination of them, hopefully you become foolproof. And you're, the, you're as strong as your weakest link at the end of the day. And asking which is your weakest link is usually a better way to go. Yeah. and and. Going back to the supply chain, I think uh, quite often there, the weakest link can be an organization that you, you just don't even think about every day. So let's say, for example, you're running a business and you have an office cleaning company do, do the cleaning for you, and you decide to whitelist their email address because, you know, they, they, you trust them to, to wash, you know, to clean the floor or empty the bins. And you suddenly find that somebody realizes that from the outside and, and then gets into the 
cleaning company and then delivers something through that email system to you and you've whitelisted it to come in or allow listed it to come in. Um, and those kinds of things where you've, re you've really got to, you've got to look at the risk of each of these different people and different institutions very, very carefully and just imagine what might happen. I think that's, that's the key as you say, and, and alluding to what you've said there um, about the weakest part of the organization. And it comes down to pattern recognition. I mean, in general, one way to probably do that is through some anomaly-based detection where you realize that certain things, you know, are off pattern. And, uh, you know, that could be time of day, it could be time of year, time of month, week, etc. And you use those patterns to sort of recognize where someone could have actually been the man in the middle trying to do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe an additional, and especially if it is sensitive data, sending in some additional, you know, having some additional layers of checks is in point, you know. Um, I know of a company where uh, they got impersonated by the middleman and uh, they sent their wire information to send wire. And then they sent about $40,000 or $100,000, depending on what it is. And uh, the, the, the wrong person received the wire. There were no enough checks and balances to make sure that someone who's filling out a wire information via email is authenticated to make sure that they're the right people that you're sending it to. Just because you get an email, it doesn't mean you just reply back with your wire information and then wire them, you know, whatever amount of money. So I've seen companies essentially do that, but there are no checks and balances to see whether it's genuinely a, you know, a company's wire. For example, you could ask for a cancelled check from the banking institution that can authenticate whether you actually have it. You can probably call in the bank and say, hey, this company has a, an account. Do they actually have a real account? And what, what name is it? So that there are there can be some steps added to it to make sure you know this doesn't happen. And I think in the end, I'll basically say it's not about how intelligent we are, it's about how less stupid we need to be. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very important distinction because intelligence seems to be in, up, you know, you know, technically in abundance, but being less stupid seems to be in scarce. Yeah, and and going back to uh, you know looking at anomalies, you, uh, you you start off talking about anomalies there. Again, this goes back to some extent to like the like of GPS with um, the, the geolocation of IP addresses. And understanding, we've got systems obviously we operate that uh, look at where traffic's coming from to see if that person is actually abroad in in a country with this particular phone, or or are they sitting in the office down the corridor? How can they be in two places at once? I appreciate that a good criminal is going to try and circumvent that by by relaying data and information, etc. But that kind of anomaly is a is, is something that we would pick up on our systems and is, is useful. Um, it's useful to be able to absolutely lock certain areas of the planet out of our system and allow certain areas to come in more readily. Um, and I think that's quite, I mean, that's quite useful. Um, in payment systems, um, and I've, I'm actually suffering a particular problem at the moment where I've sent money and it's um, it's not it's not arrived where I wanted it to arrive, and that's actually the reverse of what you were talking about. It's been a case of I've had a transaction set up that goes from a UK bank to a Spanish bank for twenty years, and the last payment didn't arrive. And why didn't it arrive? Because the receiving bank in Spain rejected it, but they didn't send a message back to the UK to say they'd rejected it instantly and I didn't get a message so and it turns out that the bank in Spain has changed the bank account number now instead of creating an alias to put that transaction into the new account with, that's linked to me they've rejected it so I've got to go through another process now of creating a test payment micro payment to test that it goes to the right place with the new account before I can move a larger sum so even if you've established a trust mechanism in place that goes back maybe decades and between two banks, a UK and a Spanish bank, and they change something, you've still got to go through that process again to ensure that the money ends up in the right place. So taking your point about uh, those kinds of things, 
you also have to review on a continuing basis that the trust you had in place can be maintained. You can't just take it, can you, for granted? So, and that's an, a lesson I've literally learned in the last uh, in the last ten days. And there's nothing I could have done about it. It, it, it because I make payments regularly. So it's just this first payment that's failed in what twenty years. Fortunately, the money was rejected and it's returned back to the UK. I haven't actually lost the money, but I, I lost visibility of it. Let's put it that way. Um, and I think we have the same thing in any commercial situation where we we have a system in place that does, you know, goes from A through B to C and we take it for granted. We forget what B does. And then one day somebody very cleverly changes B. They think they've done the right thing and they cause both A and C a problem. The standard operating procedure that we followed for, for years suddenly falls flat on its face and we have a crisis. And the crisis is we don't know whether we've been hacked or whether something else has happened. And again, this is also part of this conversation, is how do we know that the problem we're faced today technically is from somebody trying to do bad or somebody that's just made a mistake in the supply chain or somebody that's made a mistake internally, quickly ascertaining where the problem is and remediating it quickly. I mean, th I think that's actually one of the key things um, that we need to um, focus on. Absolutely. No, um, very nice meeting you. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to have a chat with you. We hope to maybe, you know, meet again and uh, we can maybe review some areas where we can potentially partner. But for now, I'll just say, you know, thank you for joining this call and uh, look forward to other opportunities to uh, meet. Yes, and you. Okay, then. Bye bye. As we wrap up this enlightening episode of the Cyber Physics Podcast, we want to express our deep appreciation to our insightful guests, Rungan Venkatraman and Adrian Smith, for sharing their wisdom with us today. Cyber Physics, in essence, has indeed brought us closer to understanding the intricate forces that govern our digital world. We hope you've gained valuable insights and inspiration to navigate the ever evolving landscape of cybersecurity. Stay connected, stay informed, and remember, the essence of cyber physics is ever-present in our connected reality. Until next time, keep exploring and seeking the equilibrium between innovation and safeguarding. Thank you for joining us on this captivating journey.